Ben Shapiro, who is a conservative podcaster and has one of the most popular podcasts in the entire world, has created an uproar for going to a podcast convention at which his his business was a sponsor. And as a former TV news reporter, I would like to talk about this uh, phenomenon that I believe journalists have either knowingly or unknowingly continued to perpetuate, which is that ideas cannot be explored because if you engage with them, you are endorsing them. And I believe that what happened with Ben Shapiro at this podcast movement, again, his business, a sponsor, so they'll take his money, but if he shows up and takes pictures with people, God help us all. This this phenomenon of people freaking out that he was there, just there, just standing there in the room taking pictures with people, this has been perpetuated by journalists. And uh, the very people who, who I thought would be the ones to explore ideas are now actually the ones who have stoked the fire to suppress ideas. So you probably have heard about what happened. This is a video that the Daily Wire put out. Actually, you know, as happens with many of these sort of cancel events, uh, cancel phenomenons, it just, it ends up helping <laughs> the people that that the mob comes after nowadays. And so I, I'm i not sure that was exactly what the people who wanted to get rid of him were after, but it certainly helped him grow uh, more views online. And this is the video that they put together. So it, it kind of explains what happens. So let's watch a little bit of it. Yesterday afternoon, Ben Shapiro briefly visited the PM22 Expo. Though he was not registered or expected, we take full responsibility for the harm done by his presence. Okay, see, it just plays into the whole idea, like there's a trigger warning and <laughs> viewer discretion is advised and we take full responsibility for the harm that he caused. Uh, let's keep watching, shall we? So do I get to get a picture? Uh, God bless you. Hey, thank you. We agreed to sell the Daily Wire a first-time booth based on the company's large presence in podcasting. The weight of that decision is now painfully clear. Okay, so saying that, yeah, they're a sponsor, you know, because they're a big podcast and we're the podcast movement. That's what we do. Okay. All right. During event planning, the dangerous nature of the company's messaging was overlooked. Okay, so... So when they were choosing to take Daily Wire's money, they just accidentally overlooked, they overlooked how dangerous the company's messaging is. And they're very sorry about that. You know what's funny though? They're still a sponsor. Or at least if you go to Podcast Movement's sponsor page, which I'll show you in a minute, Daily Wire's still there. Maybe they have a contract so they can't give the money back, or maybe they're just not giving the money back because they want the money. But I just thought that was interesting. Let's keep watching. <laughs> Those of you who called this unacceptable are right. Podcast movement has made mistakes. The pain caused by this one will always stick with us. So yes, they've, they've made mistakes and this one is never gonna, this will never leave them. This is a forever scar. Pretty obvious to me then that podcast movement originally had no problem with this partnership, but then the complaints started coming in. So I was curious who complained. According to Reclaim the Net, in this article, Podcast Conference apologizes for giving Daily Wire podcast a booth after complaints on Twitter. One of the original tweets came from this person at Starplanes. Hey, ad podcast movement, what the F? As a trans person, as a queer person, as someone with a uterus, this does not make me feel welcome. This does not make me feel safe with a picture of Ben there in the background. Just confirmed with the PodMov team that they did not know Shapiro was attending. In fact, they were told he was not. Him showing up was the first they knew about it. Does that make everything okay? No. Am I much happier knowing he was not an invited guest? Absolutely. Hashtag PM22. Restricting replies because I don't have time to moderate them. Clown in the QRTs, but make it original, please. It's odd to me that that original tweet got less than 300 retweets and yet somehow was able to turn this situation on its nose. Maybe there were other people who tweeted about it. I don't know. But Ben Shapiro showing up at events and having people protest 
is nothing new. I'm not going to go through the whole history of it. I'm going to focus on journalist protesting because that's where I come from. And I frankly think this is the most concerning for me, people who are allegedly supposed to be about uh, exploring ideas and allowing for robust debate or discussion about a particular topic, often the ones that are these days calling for speech suppression online. You may remember the Politico hoopla over Ben Shapiro writing Politico's playbook a while back. This is a New York Times article from last year about it. And it says Politico staff objects after right wing star Ben Shapiro writes newsletter. And uh, yeah, January 14th, 2021. So a year and a half ago, it says that Politico's decision to give Mr. Shapiro a turn drew a criticism or drew criticism from Politico journalists. More than 200 members of the staff joined a Zoom call with the editor-in-chief, Matthew Kaminsky, on Thursday afternoon to discuss the move. Many argued that Politico should not have given the platform to Shapiro, the host of the podcast and radio program, The Ben Shapiro Show, according to two reporters on the call who spoke on the condition of anonymity to describe internal conversations. Let me just paraphrase, okay? (laughs) Political journalists complaining that a massively popular podcast host who discusses politics should not be platformed by sharing his ideas in their political opinion section. As you saw in that New York Times article, what they said was that the political journalists were concerned about platforming him. So giving him a platform. And that's that's now the new that's now the new idea when it comes to journalism is that if you if you include ideas, especially if you include them without completely dogging them and just and just uh, writing hit pieces, then you're platforming or endorsing. You can't just explore or question or try to understand or get the full context uh, without you know the motive of basically trying to cancel somebody. Otherwise, you're endorsing them. If you have any association whatsoever, and this has been, I think, very detrimental to our communities and society as a whole. I'll get into that in a second, but Remember this, uh, this is an NPR article, maybe you haven't seen it, but this was July of 2021, Outrage as a Business Model, How Ben Shapiro is Using Facebook to Build an Empire. I, I think this is what this is really about. This, These are the numbers that they are showing here, okay? This is, <laughs> these down here, like these uh, different colored, um, well, that's Breitbart, but the green is more mainstream. Washington Post, um... Uh, who's that? New York Times, CNN. These are, uh, this is news analysis, basically engagement per article. And this is the Daily Wire. This is what I think is is freaking them out. <laughs> and not not necessarily overtly because they're thinking, oh, you know, we're losing the popularity contest. I think they think we're losing the popularity contest to somebody who's very damaging he's very damaging and we're losing the popularity contest. And so we've got to figure out, you know, we got to figure out a way to shut this guy up because this is dangerous for people. It's very dangerous. This is why they're constantly talking about misinformation online and the problems of misinformation. And they rarely, if ever discuss the danger of the misinformation that is spread in the legacy press. You know, whenever you see fact checkers, they're typically fact checking Jim Bob on Twitter, somebody on Twitter Um, they're not typically fact checking each other. And then when they get something wrong, it's just that they made a mistake. It's not that there's this greater problem with corporate news, right? It's like when, when somebody messes up online or in a podcast, it's, it's representative of some greater phenomenon, this greater issue that we need to address when corporate news makes a mistake, a little boo boo. It's just an editor's note. That's all we need. We just need an editor's note. We just made a mistake. It's not, it's not reflective of any larger phenomenon of sort of problematic disinformation that's constantly spreading corporate news. No, 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 that would, that would be conspiracy theory. If you take this particular incident of Ben Shapiro showing up at the podcast movement and everybody freaking out, it's actually the outrage of of many other sectors of society, ideological sectors of society that drives people to Ben Shapiro. People feel like they they can't discuss certain ideas or listen to certain ideas from other information providers and So because there's all this outrage about these ideas with these information providers that won't let you talk about A, B, C, D, or E, 
They go listen to Ben Shapiro. So who's driving the outrage? Like whose outrage is it really? That That's that's a, a question I have. I remember when Trump was elected and I went into the newsroom the next day after covering the Hillary Clinton watch party, which I was assigned to, and hearing journalists talk about all these stories of just how freaked out people were. And I remember also having seen their personal social media pages, you know, some of my colleagues who were actually the ones who were really freaked out. So they were seeing it in the community at large and then picking news stories based on their own, their own outrage or their own, their own sense of offense about what had just happened. And I kept sitting there thinking like, you know, you think that guy is the problem, but half the country voted for him. And, and I, I'm always fascinated by people who freak out at the messenger without taking any interest in why the messenger has such a large audience. I mean, the idea is if like you could just get rid of that guy, shut him down and um, poof, you know, you got rid of these ideas that you hate so much. You just got to get rid of the guy. I don't know if this is a joke or if Ben's serious. Honestly, this whole thing, I had a really hard time deciphering whether this was a joke. Like the tweets from the podcast movement, responses to it. Ben's, I, 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 I honestly like some of this. I'm sitting back and I'm, I'm wondering if this is just, uh, is this all just theatrics? But Ben writes, literally shaking right now. Podcast movement is threatening my right to exist. This is erasure. It's just, it's all just so ironic. If ironic is the right word to use here, or it just upside down. It's totally upside down because. First off, the podcast movement conference is about growing podcasting. (laughs) The guy's got an extremely popular podcast and uh, he was, uh, his business was a sponsor. They were, they were obviously willing to take the money. They saw that this is a a huge organization and they invited them to have a booth there. This is the podcast movement's Dallas 2022 sponsor list and right there, is the Daily Wire still still there as a sponsor? Like I said, maybe they have a contract so they can't break that and they're keeping them up. But um, when my industry of corporate news made the sort of decision, whether it was intentionally made or to just kind of, you know, one outlet or another outlet just starts following the crowd on this kind of platforming or endorsing idea when you're associating to understand or, or, or to debate or, or discuss or whatever, whenever that decision was made, like I said, overt or covert or intentional or unintentional, that's what got us to this point. And and maybe not the only reason, but one of the main reasons, like if the very people who are supposed to be questioning, allowing for debate, allowing for discussion about really tough ideas are literally going to training right now, which I know they are, behind the scenes to learn about the appropriate ways to discuss hot topics. Uh, and and are essentially under this impression or are being told by their corporations or they're just learning in school or they just grew up in this environment or it's just become it's become the ethos of the newsroom that if you in any way associate with somebody like i said if somebody walks in the door and you don't just like immediately kick them out because think about the news the news version of that is inviting someone on your show and pouncing on them like that's the only acceptable way to have somebody come on nowadays and discuss ideas is to like pounce on them. That's otherwise you're just endorsing them. And and I get that from people, you know, and actually I get it in the inverse from people in the, in the podcasting world. Like if I have somebody that's not extreme enough then people are like, Oh, how, you know, you're so naive. How could you have this person on? They're not, they're not, they're not woke enough. You know, when it comes to some of these topics about COVID or whatever else, like you should only talk to these kinds of people. And it's the same phenomenon. It's the same phenomenon from the alternative media world. World as it is in the corporate media world and audiences react very similarly. That's why I'm, I'm very clear. Like when I cover censorship, I talk to all kinds of different people. And, uh, and I, I just think it's unfortunate that we've gotten to this point where the, the folks who, the, if there's anyone who should feel like empowered to, <laughs> to go after ideas that are unpopular, it should be a journalist. And the fact that journalists are, we're seeing, the ones calling for censorship or what's the future of misinformation. You know, this is a danger. And uh, Politico journalists are in an uproar over Ben Shapiro trying to shut down different voices. If, if they're leading the charge, or at least they're one of the main proponents of this new world of, of 
asking questions or debating or discussing or even just listening, just listening to someone is endorsing their views, then, um, you know, we need to take responsibility for that. And and that's just the way I see it. I, I, I see, I, I, I saw that in 2016 when the New York Times said that we're going to do things differently because of this imminent danger called Donald Trump. And then the next imminent danger was COVID. And what are the other imminent dangers? Elections or, you know, any, any other thing, Russia, that, that we just, we just have to, you know, we have to be aggressive. We, we can't be objective anymore. We have to be aggressive. And, and this idea of uh, guilty by association that you can't just listen to somebody. We, we've, uh, we've helped corral the public into this idea that, you you are just safer and uh, better off by not knowing what your ideological adversary thinks. And I just I don't know how we hoodwink the public into thinking that, but it's wrong. And I, 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 I just I'm surprised that this is still happening. Honestly, I thought we were past the point where people were were still apologizing over someone standing and taking a selfie with a person uh, as, as dangerous. Uh, but we, as journalists who have perpetuated that idea by cheering for censorship, by calling for, for lockdowns on information for, um, you know, just being some of the, (laughs) some of the main purveyors of disinformation and misinformation, and yet never looking at ourselves and questioning and critiquing ourselves, uh, but, but constantly pointing the finger outward. Uh, we're, we are at least in part, if not in large part, to blame for situations like this. And, you know, at the end of the day, the podcast movement issue, like this space and time is not really, to me, it's, it is what it is. It's one event, it happened. But it's, it's a string of, of uh, phenomena that continues to happen that bothers me. And what really bothers me when I think about it you know, where I really think the problem is, I should say, when it really starts to become damaging is when, you know, I see comments in the comment section from people saying that they can't even talk to their family anymore. They've lost family members. They've lost friends over this idea because, because we have modeled to people with our behavior that you are either in danger or you're going to get canceled or there's something dirty about you. You have ideological leprosy, whatever it is. If you associate with somebody who has a different idea than you do that we we've modeled that behavior as journalists, as the very people who are supposed to be the information seekers, scared of no place, scared of no place, no, no place of questions, no place of darkness that, that we, we go where others won't go because that's what a journalist does. And we've modeled to people that actually we just stay in safe spaces. And I think that's really unfortunate. Anyway, one space that you can feel really rogue about is allisonwinepromo.com because there's actually the rogue Malbec. Go to allisonwinepromo.com and support my work with some amazing Malbecs. These are high altitude Malbecs. Like I said, one's called the rogue Malbec. Uh, one comes from almost 9,000 feet. One uses natural fermentation. Another from a vineyard where they handpicked the grapes. That's actually the rogue. And it's a, it's a great way if you're already drinking wine to keep me in business. So if you like this video, go to allisonwinepromo.com and support my work. You can also, if you're a coffee or a tea drinker, get yourself some USDA certified organic high altitude Nicaraguan roast. There's light roast, there's dark roast, there's a limited uh, black edition, which is very good. I also like uh, the cigar number one. It's it's a dark roast. I'm a dark roast drinker. But if you like tea, go check out the Katura tea. It's a tea made from coffee fruit. It tastes a lot like black tea. I actually cold brew mine for 24 hours. And I think I'm going to start making kombucha. I've said that before, but I will show you when I finally get my kombucha together with it, I'm going to show you my uh, twininginecoffee.com slash Allison kombucha. So if you like to do that kind of stuff, or you just like tea, go check out my sponsors. Anyway, thanks for watching this video. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you go somewhere else after this because I get suspended regularly and I'll see y'all next time.